uh, bridge maintenance painting and, uh, in the land of 10,000 lakes for, by Minnesota DOT's novel approach to improving bridge maintenance painting uh, uh, operations. I'm sorry. We have two presenters here. Uh, one of them is Sarah Sondag, who spoke at the general session. Her co-presenter, Mr. Rich Burgess. Good afternoon and welcome to maintenance painting, uh, bridge maintenance painting in the land of 10,000 lakes. Um, this presentation that we're going to provide, actually a lot of this information has, has been out in the industry now for a couple of years from some work that was done a while ago. So um, what I plan to do is kind of give a, creep, uh, a quick review of some of the information and the, the, uh, what we feel are the important points of the work that's been done, after which Sarah will get up and bring you up to date on what the department's been doing since then. So it really started uh, for KTA uh, by conducting a one-day coding uh, training class for the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Um, this was attended by supervisors, engineers, and lead workers from various districts throughout the state. It was a bit of an enlightening course uh, for a lot of the attendees because there were some important outcomes that came out of it um, as a result of having attended the course, uh, uh, MnDOT realized that they could benefit from a, a more uniform method to rate coding systems, coding conditions on the structures that they have, and that they could benefit from having a process to select and prioritize maintenance painting strategies on their structures. Minnesota, unlike many states, has their own in-house maintenance staff that do some painting. It's not their only responsibility but they have their own staff that gets involved in some of the maintenance painting activities. So as a result of these realizations, uh, four uh, objective approach was developed to try and assist Minnesota DOT with this. So as a joint effort, we undertook a uh, transport research synthesis, a TRS, uh, to try and identify the best maintenance painting practices for Minnesota's needs prepare a Minnesota Bridge Maintenance Painting Manual for their workers and personnel, and then develop additional uh, materials and information to aid the MnDOT personnel in carrying out those new duties, responsibilities, and, and having an effective program. The research synthesis that was conducted, it's TRS-1404, it's available on the Minnesota website if you're interested in reading the whole gory details. Or you can try and just Google TRS space 1404 and it should pop up as a PDF. It's, it's a great snoozer if you're having trouble sleeping. We covered five topic areas as part of this. We actually surveyed, sent out surveys to 52 different DOTs and bridge authorities. And the questionnaires were divided in these five categories that are, you see here on the slides and got the responses back and evaluated the responses and, and published the, the TRS from that. So one of the first topics was coding condition assessments. Who's doing them? Who's not doing them? How are they doing them? Bridge maintenance painting strategies. Surface preparation methods that were commonly used. Coding systems that were commonly used and also for the different agencies and DOTs, who was doing the work? Was it being done in-house, out-of-house, or, or jointly? In terms of the coding condition assessments, uh, we're not going to hit the dirty details about how to go about doing this. It was, it was covered during the training and in, in addressed in more detail in the TRS. But one of the things that was interesting in terms of responses is that uh, Ten percent of the responders don't even do code and condition assessments. They just rely on biennial inspections or maybe a message from somebody. I'm not sure who that would be, but um, but in the other cases, so you've got uh, uh, agencies that do their own assessments. Thirty-three percent of the responders and agencies that use outside providers. Forty-five percent. And then there are agencies that use outside providers only, and that's about 12%. So there's lots of work out there to be done in terms of the assessments. The second topic that we uh, 
asked questions about had to do with maintenance painting strategies. And you'll recognize these as the most, you know, these are the common maintenance painting strategies that departments and chemical plants and, and people that paint steel have recognized for years now. There's, there's basically these five options. So we wanted to find out which maintenance painting strategies were being used by the transportation agencies. Well, uh, you'll see the table on the left uh, adds up more to a, more than 100%, and that's because people had multiple options. So in terms of those five maintenance strategies, uh, the questions, uh, the responses came back that uh, some agencies use only one strategy, and my guess that's removal and replacement. 27% um, of the agencies use four different strategies. And of course, do nothing is also an option. But uh, it was kind of surprising that some of the agencies actually follow through all four of those different maintenance strategies for doing work uh, on their structures. Surface preparation methods that were being used uh, and the response to those questions were that, uh, you know, you're doing hand tool cleaning, SP11, SP15, SP3, hand tool cleaning, but also uh, one agency is doing white metal blast cleaning. Most of them are doing near white blast cleaning or commercial blast cleaning and others for maintenance painting to get involved with brush off blast cleaning. Uh, interestingly enough, there is uh, uh, some people that get involved in chemical stripping, which is a great way to take off the lead paint, but it really doesn't prepare the steel, but uh, it was the response uh, that we had to that question. Other surface preparation methods. Um, we were interested in wet methods for, for a variety of reasons. One being, of course, the increasing concern about chlorides and so forth and chloride mitigation. So how popular were, were the uh, wet surface preparation methods. 49% of the responders don't use wet. Just stay away from it. They don't want to deal with it one, one reason or another. 47% um, use low pressure water cleaning. And of course that's the wash off surfaces. It's pretty common when you're going to do spot repairs and overcoating to power wash the areas to be overcoated, remove dirt and debris and so forth. Um, and of that 47%, uh, a number of those actually go to higher pressures. So you have some agencies that are using high pressure water cleaning and other agencies that get into uh, high pressure water jetting, ultra high pressure water jetting, and even wet abrasive blast cleaning. Although they're not as popular as the uh, uh, low pressure water cleaning in terms of wet methods. In terms of the coating systems, topic area four, what coating systems were being used? Well, of the responders, um, there are multiple systems used. There's nobody that responded that just had one single go-to system. So there are multiple uh, different systems that were used. The uh, use of moisture-cured urethane is still pretty popular. It's about 26% of responders. Um, other popular systems for maintenance painting include the epoxy mastics, and the epoxy, epoxy mastics might get a polyurethane overcoat, uh, an acrylic overcoat, in one instance, uh, an agency using polysiloxane over the surface. In conjunction with the maintenance painting, there were occasions where the penetrating epoxy sealers, the epoxy penetrating sealers, were part of the system, depending on the condition of the steel when they were doing the maintenance painting. Decision was made whether that would be beneficial as part of the maintenance painting system. So that's also one that uh, seemed to be fairly popular. Calcium sulfonate alkalid, alkyds uh, are being used, plain alkyds still being used, and uh, acrylics uh, on occasion are also used. So in terms of the maintenance painting coating systems, there's quite a variety out there, and uh, I suppose they all have their places, but I was kind of surprised that uh, some of these materials were as popular as they were. In terms of full replacement coating systems, the responses that we got, um, obviously zinc rich coatings for full replacement are the most popular. And we've shown the distribution of people using a single system, the, the primers would be an inorganic zinc or an epoxy zinc rich, 
The other primarily would be another organic zinc rich coating such as the Meister Cure Urethane, be a popular primer for use. Um, some of the agencies use two different systems. Again, they use the zinc, but then other top coats or intermediate coats. Uh, some responders use three different systems, and including in that group, there was some metallizing that's being done. And actually, with the metallizing, although there are not a large number of agencies using it, uh, metallizing that is sealed is more popular than unsealed metallizing. And, and that kind of makes sense uh, when you're investing that kind of money in doing the work. And then the fifth topic area that we inquired about uh, was who's doing the work. And we found out that uh, we had one agency where the work was being done exclusively by in-house crews. 59% um, use outside work crews, contractors exclusively, and the balance of nearly 35% uh, use a combination of contractors along with their in-house uh, personnel and Minnesota would be one of those uh, agencies. Once this information was gathered and compiled, uh, we went through it to try and help to assemble uh, the best maintenance painting practices for the Minnesota DOT and put it together in a maintenance painting manual. So uh, in working with the DOT and finding out what systems they liked, which systems they'd been using, identifying those materials, and then trying to set up a process or a procedure for determining when to use maintenance painting, determining who should use, who should do the maintenance painting, and then also what surface preparation and maintenance work should be done for that painting. Um, in order to help them accomplish this, we put together a, uh, a condition assessment rating system uh, for painted steel, painted galvanizing, as well as painted weathering steel, and in addition, rating system for looking at uncoated galvanized and weathering steels. Uh, we developed some uh, resources and guidance for conducting the uh, coating condition assessment and additional testing requirements if the department was going to overcoat. Uh, when we talk about overcoating, we recognize there's a risk. There are certain characteristics both physical and chemical of the coating systems that's, that are important to us. So the physical characteristics would be the adhesion or the thickness or the number of coating layers. Chemical characteristics would be the presence of toxic heavy metals or asbestos. Um, in addition to that is identifying what the existing top coats are if you're looking for a compatible overcoat system. So those are some of the, uh, the chemical properties we looked at. Um, and then, so uh, we looked at if the decision was to do overcoating, additional testing would be done. So the typical condition assessment tests wouldn't be done to assess the risk unless it was determined that overcoating was, going, was a viable option and worth considering. In terms of the best practices for uh, surface preparation, spot repairs or spot repair and overcoat, um, pressure washing, initially to remove dirt and debris off the surface, degreasing, SP1, because of road salts, chloride testing to see if there's any remediation, hand and power tool cleaning, maybe commercial grade power tool cleaning may be needed if there's heavy rust or pitting, uh, pack rust being present. So those would be the preparation techniques. For removal and replacement, degreasing obviously, chloride testing again because of the road salts and so forth, pressure washing if needed, and abrasive blast cleaning, typically to SP10. I've got pressure washing there red uh, because it's becoming an increasing problem for some departments to do pressure washing on their structures, particularly their large structures, because of environmental concerns. Do they collect the wash water? Do they not collect the wash water? How do they manage the wash water? So this develops into another aspect that has to be taken into account if you're using those wet methods of surface preparation. The coating systems, recommended coating systems for spot repair or overcoating, epoxy mastic and polyurethane. Uh, and then again, the epoxy penetrating sealer might make sense depending on the condition of the steel. For removal and replacement, 
organic coating zinc-rich primer, as well as moisture-cured urethanes and a polyurethane, polysiloxane finish coat on the uh, inorganic zincs or, or the organic zinc-rich coatings. The bridge maintenance painting manual was assembled, and you can see here the different sections of that manual. And uh, section 8.2 really had to do with coating condition assessments. The process that was used was to take good, fair, poor, and severe, do it for general paint system deterioration, do it for galvanized systems, galvanized whether it was painted or not, weathering steel painted or not. If the galvanizing or the weathering steel were painted, it would be evaluated in the same fashion that a, a painted structure would be evaluated. In addition to the paint system itself, the other superstructure elements come into play. What are their conditions? How much corrosion, distortion, cracking, alignment, connection issues arise for these different elements? And then in addition to that, the assessment includes things like section loss for the integrity of the structure. So that in developing the maintenance programs for the bridges, uh, that's taken into account as well to decide what sort of work needs to be conducted. The result of that process led to some flow diagrams, and uh, these flow diagrams basically will take you through a stepwise process. In this case, to examine the protective coatings on the steel, you go to the bridge, you look at it, is it painted or not painted? If it's painted, it takes you in one direction, you rate it, uh, rate the painting system on it, as well as the condition of the elements and the uh, structural integrity. If it's not painted, if it's weathering steel, uh, for example, you'd look at the patina of the weathering steel, uh, the corrosion, and again, section loss for that. You see it'll take it to either uh, diagram C or diagram B. Of course, if it takes you to diagram B, we get a bit of a more complex examination here. Um, so if it's in good condition, maybe it doesn't need any maintenance painting. If it's in fair condition, well, maybe it doesn't meet, need any, maybe it could use a little bit of maintenance painting. Um, if it's more corroded or if it has uh, a ratings of poor or severe, uh, then there's some deeper things we want to look at. We want to start looking at the corrosion, distortion of the, the metal sections and the uh, steel elements um, for a degree of deterioration. Make a determination whether this particular structure needs to have a structural assessment for, this, for the integrity. And so that will take you to two other paths, depending on the findings uh, from that flow chart. Diagram C, uh, this is the one we use just for evaluating the weathering steel, looking at the patina, different ways to assess the patina, and make a determination on what maintenance strategies might be appropriate for it, if painting is necessary. Diagram D, in this case, if it looks like maintenance painting and overcoating is an option. We want to assess the risk of overcoating. So this flow diagram takes us into the process where we go out and measure thickness, test adhesion, so forth and so on, to assess the risk of trying to overcoat this particular structure. And you'll either accept the risk or not, depending on the outcomes of that. Uh, but given the data, you then have to make some sort of an assessment as to what the risk is and whether it's acceptable or not. And these are the, the fairly common uh, metrics that we use to determine the condition of the coating and, and whether in fact overcoating might carry a high risk or, or a low risk. Diagram E finally was when we decided we're going to do some maintenance painting, determining who's going to do the work. Now, as I mentioned previously, Minnesota DOT, they have in-house forces that do maintenance painting, and of course, they also have contracts that they issue for maintenance painting. And this process takes us through making a determination of who's best suited to do the work. So for example, if it's a fairly complex structure or there's a large surface area that may have lead paint to be removed, typically that's issued as a contract. However, if it's within the resources of the different districts and the personnel available, then it will be done in-house. So this matrix takes you through that process. Once you finally decided what uh, approach you're going to take, 
then this will take you, depending on whether you're doing touch-up, um, touch-up and overcoating, removal, zone work, and zone's always a possibility, uh, where to go to identify the surface preparation requirements as well as the coating system requirements. Currently, MnDOT has an APL for replacement coating systems, and they're listed here for the different types of maintenance that's being done. But when it comes to maintenance, there is not an APL, an approved products list, only for full removal and replacement. One of the goals is to establish an approved products list for maintenance painting projects that are done in-house. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Sarah. The update of the maintenance painting manual then also contained safety considerations and procedures and best practices for each maintenance painting strategy. Objective four then was to develop this additional information or guidance for MnDOT personnel, including a coding condition assessment guide, some training, and a test site. So the coding condition assessment field guide contains images of various bridge elements, such as beam ends, trusses, hinges, in various condition states, good, fair, poor, and severe, to assist bridge inspection inspectors in conducting coding assessments. This is just a screenshot um, from the guide here. We have a couple copies, if anybody's interested in looking at it, of the definitions for good, fair, poor, and severe, and then also example photos of elements within those condition states. The second piece of objective four was to um, conduct a bridge maintenance painting workshop again with in partnership with KTA. So we introduced the bridge maintenance painting manuals that, that Rich mentioned in, in the beginning part of this presentation. We introduced this coding assessment guide and we facilitated a workshop. And the idea of the workshop was to look at maintenance painting scenarios and photos, utilize the guide to perform a coding condition assessment, and then using the flow charts to select the appropriate maintenance painting strategy. Again, kind of more of a hands-on approach to be able to utilize these resources that we were providing. Uh, we wanted to look at a maintenance painting test site. So we selected a site in St. Paul, and the idea was to apply various combinations of surface preparation methods and coatings using in-house crews. And we wanted to use minimal surface prep, again, um, because it was being performed by our in-house crews, and try to figure out what combinations of prep using hand tool and power tool cleaning and maintenance coating systems that could allow us to achieve like a five-year service life in some of our critical areas. And we'd evaluate those over a three-year period. So Minnesota uh, for the test site partnered with SEH in October of 2014 and the idea was to develop maintenance painting procedures for MnDOT agency crews. And as Rich mentioned, they're also responsible for many other maintenance activities. <clears throat> and so we opted for that minimal surface prep and also worked with coating manufacturers to identify coating systems with the idea and consideration made for existing conditions, amount of surface prep, ease of surface prep, ease of application, availability and cost, environmental and safety considerations, and to achieve that five-year service life. So we looked at generic coding systems. These are some of the test site locations and coding systems that were applied in five different locations within our test site. We did a field evaluation, or started a field evaluation, looking at pre-existing conditions, application procedures, again evaluating kind of that ease of application, ease of use for our crews, and then coding performance over three years. And the evaluation criteria included adhesion, rusting, blistering, and pitting. And some of the next slides I'll show are some of the test locations showing the existing condition and then the conditions over three years, so far, or existing condition just after coding and then two years of evaluation. In each coding area, we tried to split the area where we would apply minimal hand tool preparation and then some more, a little more extensive power tool cleaning to try to see how the coating would perform with those two different levels of surface preparation. We tried to get uh, locations where it was similar conditions, but again, it was five different beams, five different areas, and so you do have some variability in existing conditions. 
And there was one area specifically where we ran into a little bit of an issue because it had an anti-graffiti coating. And we couldn't just overcoat or prep lightly an anti-graffiti coating and expect the coating to last, the maintenance coating to last. And in this case also we had more extensive corrosion on the bottom flange and so it took more effort to actually power tool this surface. And so we introduced some variability into the results by having these kind of varying locations. And so we decided to do a little bit additional testing uh, to eliminate some of that variability and minimize that surface prep to only SP1 and spot SP2 where needed. So if there was some evidence of blistering or corrosion, then we would use some SP2. We also just used uh, the prime coat. Again, with that idea that we're only looking for maybe a five-year service life, we may not need that top coat for UV resistance. It's just a screenshot of the maintenance painting test site where the additional testing was done. So we just picked a, a portion of a beam and we taped off different areas and we did minimal surface prep and applied the coatings and we'll be evaluating them as well as the other test locations. So finally the next steps will be the third year evaluation in August. The final report will come out in November. We'll update the bridge maintenance painting manual as a result of the conclusions and recommendations from the study. Um, with the variability, like I said, we decided to do some additional testing because of it, but it can also help us determine uh, where might be the right time to introduce maintenance. You know, with preventive maintenance, you really want to get on the beams when there is still in good condition so that you're doing, you're able to do minimal surface prep and still get extended life out of the coating system. We'll do some additional field evaluations by um, in-house forces and then we'll hopefully be able to identify a bridge maintenance coating APL from a lot of this work. I'd like to ask you, uh, are all your bridge maintenance personnel in a lead uh, compliance program where they have lead level type of thing and uh, so on? Um, no, not all our employees are. We have an industrial hygienist that will come out and do some monitoring for us. We used to do a lot more painting previously, and we got away from it a little bit because of lead and other issues with PCBs in some existing coatings. And at the time when we were doing more painting, they were on uh, a program uh, for lead testing. And now we've kind of moved toward not working as much on lead structures, so we, we are limited for the amount of square footage that we need to, that we can remove with in-house forces for lead paint. And then we'll have the industrial hygienist on site for monitoring to make sure that the exposure levels aren't exceeding what they should. And that's what you did in this test site also? Correct. And the, within the test site, we had our industrial hygienist on site monitoring. Have you seen the results of the ECD chart paint project 1430 for response painting? No. Thank you. Can you repeat the question? Can you repeat the question? He asked if I had seen the results of the NCHRP 1430 study. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.